In a previous video, I used Microsoft Excel as a cube browser to demonstrate data retrieval from an OLAP cube based on a multi-dimensional data warehouse containing details of over half a million Canadian patent bibliographic documents published by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office from 2001 through 2011. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate the use of a report server to retrieve data from the same OLAP cube and multi-dimensional data warehouse. Why would you use a report server? Well, there's at least two reasons. For example, casual users may not fully understand how to interact with a cube's measures and dimensions. As a second example, some users may not have login credentials for the network or domain on which the cube and the data warehouse are stored. Browsing a cube located on a remote network or domain can be tricky for some users. Those concerns can be addressed by providing a report server stocked with a selection of carefully crafted reports which are likely to suit most users' needs. Casual users don't need to worry about measures or dimensions. They're taken care of when the reports are designed and an ordinary web browser can be used to access the report server, even if it's located on a remote network or domain. So let's have a look at a report server. Here, as you can see, I'm running Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer, and we're looking at a report server having a collection of reports in a folder which I have designated CIPO Report Project. Uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, all of the reports are collected in that one folder, but you could just as easily organize them if you preferred in a sequence of subfolders for more contextually uh, relevant access depending on your particular requirements. You can see that the reports have descriptive names. Uh, each report also has a reasonably extensive tooltip type uh, description. So you just hover your mouse and uh, I'll see if I can expand that a bit so that you can see in a little more detail the sort of tooltip that can be provided for each report. Pick another example here. Again, see if I can expand that so that you can see the tooltip. But each one of these reports can have a tooltip of up to 255 characters, which helps the user determine whether this particular report might or might not be uh, suitable for whatever they're interested in seeing. In order to run a report, you just click on it. So I'll begin with this simple dashboard report, and as you can see, it provides six static charts. There's a header which tells us uh, a little bit of information about the data warehouse on which the OLAP cube is based. Uh, this type pie chart in the top left corner illustrates the importance of the Patent Cooperation Treaty to Canada. You can see that for this particular data set, uh, fully 67% of the applications came into Canada via the uh, national phase entry from the PCT. This chart shows you the kind code breakdown, late open applications, issued patents, etc. This language pie chart uh, reflects the fact that in uh, Canada has two official languages, English and French. Patent applications can be filed in either one of those languages. And again, for this particular data set, we can see that 3.8% or some 20,687 uh, documents were filed in French. This license available pie chart reflects the fact that um, upon payment of the issue fee to the CIPO, it's possible uh, to request that uh, an indication of an available license be uh, published in the Canadian Patent Office record with the grant particulars for that case. Then we have two um, chart breakdowns. This upper chart uh, illustrates the PCT versus non-PCT filings by calendar year for the years indicated. The uh, chart below gives the year-by-year -year breakdown for uh, by kind code 
as you can see. To go back to the report collection, I just click up here and here we are. Let's have a look at a different report. We'll try this uh, documents by agent report. And before we get into the substance of this report, there are a few formalities points that may be of interest. For example, most of these reports have so-called floating headers. So if I drag the scroll bar down on the right, you can see that that header, uh, the blue background uh, header that is, stays in place as I scroll. These are also uh, multiple page reports. You can see that this is an eight page report indicated right there. If I click the next page arrow, uh, here's page two, click again, here's page three. I can go to the last page by clicking here. I can go back to the first page by clicking there. In the rightmost column, we have so-called data bars, which help highlight uh, or give a quick visual highlight of the relative importance of the information displayed on that row. The significance of these data bars will become a bit more apparent to you when I sort the report, uh, which is possible using these um, up-down arrow buttons that you see in the header for each of these columns. So I can just click the um, down arrow here, and there is the report sorted by rank in terms of uh, the number of documents uh, which name each of these Canadian patent agent firms that you see listed on the uh, left. If you um, are interested in any of these firms, you can just click on the name. Cass and McLean, for example, opens up a web browser and here is that firm's website. And if you need their contact particulars, uh, a way you can go to the website and obtain them. Um, the reports also have um, uh, interactive parameter selections. So, for example, uh, maybe in your particular situation, you're really only interested in documents that were directly filed in Canada, that is not uh, PCT national phase entries. Maybe you're only interested in issued patents in terms of kind code. Maybe you're only interested in documents that were filed in the French language. Uh, having selected some combination of parameters that's of interest, you can re-render the report just clicking that View Report button. We can uh, sort it again. And anyone familiar with uh, Canadian patent practice will not be surprised uh, by the information shown here, the Rubik firm, the Goodrow Gage de Burke firm, uh, file, as you can see, a considerable number of cases in the French language on behalf of their clients. Let's go back to the report collection, another report that may be of interest uh, to some people is this uh, documents by applicant nationality and filing distribution. Here you can see that the report has been pre-configured to select applicants having Canadian nationality, uh, but you can change that if you wish. For example, maybe you would like to run a comparison of applicants from not just Canada, possibly you're also interested in applicants with French nationality, German nationality, and maybe applicants from the United States of America as well. You can also, if you wish, uh, restrict the uh, filing date selection. Maybe you want uh, to window in on 2006, 7, 8, and 9, for example. Rerun the report, and there you can see the breakdown, uh, again with a graph presented for each of those applicant nationality categories and notice that each of those charts are scaled on the vertical axis. They look rather similar, but if you check the vertical scales, you can see the differences as reflected by the numbers, which appear in the number of dates columns. If we go back to the report collection, you can see down at the bottom here, we have quite a number of so-called top reports. These are a fairly common type of report in uh, 
multi-dimensional data warehouses, OLAP cubes, that sort of thing. Let's have a look at the top 25 applicants report. What this is showing you is the number of documents which name a particular applicant ranked um, from highest number to lowest for the top 25 uh, instances in the data warehouse for all nationalities. You can see that the default selection of the applicant nationality up here is all nationalities or all applicants, all filing years, and all kind codes. Um, up at the top here, you can see something of an anomaly. This ranking number one is somebody called undefined. Well, that uh, is simply showing us that for 4,312 documents in the data warehouse, uh, the applicant's nationality is simply unknown. When the CIPO published the bibliographic information for these cases, for some reason the applicant nationality was not included in the bibliographic data. But that's okay because maybe what you're really interested in is not all nationalities as we saw there, but what you would instead like to see perhaps is just Canadian applicants. So there's your top 25 Canadian applicants for all, uh, all years. Maybe what you wanted to do was a different sort of comparison. Maybe you'd like to get some idea of um, German and French and United States applicants as we did a moment ago, but this time in the context of this particular report, there's US applicants. And maybe really all you want is a restricted date range in terms of filing dates. Maybe again you're only interested in 2006, 7, 8, and 9, maybe. So I'll re-render that report and we'll see what we get and you can see uh, the results in this particular situation. Notice that there is no number 25 in this particular case. That's a simple result of the ranking function uh, that's embedded in the MDX query that stands behind this particular report. Um, if you're interested in learning more about any of these applicants, you can just click on them and opens up a web browser and you can scroll down and it looks like uh, if you wanted to go to the uh, website of that particular applicant then this, um, this site right here uh, might be a good candidate to have a look at. Again here you can see uh, the visual indication provided by the data bars as we run our eye down the rightmost column. Another top report that uh, may be of interest is this top 10 IPC subclasses by applicant nationality. Uh, this illustrates uh, another way in which charts can be embedded in reports. Uh, this, um, this report, like most of the other reports, uh, the default parameter selection is everything. So maybe you don't want to see everything, Maybe you're only interested in seeing the IPC subclass information for cases filed on behalf of applicants having Canadian nationality, and maybe you'd like to check that out for just one year, maybe 2008. So we can re-render that report. And here we see the top 10 IPC subclasses for, uh, in which uh, Canadian patent applications were filed on behalf of applicants with uh, Canadian nationality in calendar year 2008. Let's try the same thing. Whoops. Notice that E21B and H04L are the top uh, IPC subclasses in that particular example. Let's try the same report for Oh, let's try, say, Switzerland and see how things come out. I'll just re-render that report and you can see it's a very different 
a set of IPC subclasses that the Swiss are interested in, at least when they file in Canada. If you want to check out what those subclasses are, you can just click on them and we hop across to WIPO's IPC database. C07D, as you can see, is heterocyclic compounds. A61K is preparations for medical, dental, and toilet purposes, etc., etc., and so on down the line. And you can, uh, uh, as, a, as I've indicated, uh, reconfigure this report as you wish by choosing different parameters. There are other ways in which we can investigate information about IPC classification. For example, this report gives us a drill down capability that may be of interest. In this case, um, it takes a little longer to render and load the report because instead of pulling information just from the OLAP cube, which is fast typically, in this example we're going back to the data warehouse for some leaf level information. Um, here again you can see the breakdown uh, for everything there you can see our total of 539,108 recall that's the total number of uh, Canadian patent bibliographic publications represented in the cube um, you can drill down um, for in, through any of these IPC section B takes it a moment to pull up the others uh, and you'll notice that they're ranked not in numerical order of class, but rather uh, they're ranked according to their significance in terms of the number of documents, uh, Canadian patent documents, that is, having the particular IPC class. And you can drill down all, all the way. Again, it's going back out to the data warehouse in some of these situations. I'll go right down to the subgroup level just so you can get an idea. And I'm just picking random examples here. And again, at each level, as I drill down, I can, if I wish, click and uh, hop over to WIPO's uh, IPC uh, database in order to see uh, just what those classifications might be. Again, you can um, uh, restrict or filter the report results if you wish by choosing applicant nationality or year of filing. These are just the parameters that I have chosen to include in this particular report. There are many other parameters that one might choose in a particular situation. Here's a report that may be of interest to some people. You may know that in Canada it's possible for an application to claim so-called internal priority. This is a mechanism for claiming priority on the basis of a previously filed Canadian patent application. We call that internal priority. If I sort this, sorted the wrong way, let's do it again. You can see here that internal priority claims are far and away used most often by applicants having Canadian nationality. The United States comes in second and so on down the line. And you can investigate this if you wish. You can ex expand any of these. Uh, here we can see the list of 18 documents for applicants having Irish nationality, which supposedly contain internal priority claims based on one or more uh, Canadian patent applications. Let's check that out. I'll just uh, click on one of them. This opens up the Canadian Intellectual Property Office's online database uh, record for that particular document. And I will just scroll down here. Let's see what we get. Well, yes, indeed, there's an applicant having Irish nationality and if we go a little further here's the priority data and yes indeed you can see it's a claiming priority based on a previous Canadian application as expected. One more report that we will look at before I close off average prosecution time is something that patent attorneys and patent applicants are 
frequently concerned about. This gives you the um, average prosecution times for the entire data set. Uh, now, recall that in Canada, patent applications are not automatically examined. It's necessary to submit a specific request for examination and pay the government examination fee. And so this report uh, is giving you information only for issued Canadian patent documents and the average years in prosecution column is telling you about the time frame between the date on which examination was requested and the date on which the patent was actually granted. You can drill down through any of these if you uh, want to investigate further and see uh, right down to the week level how the uh, prosecution times pan out. But in most cases, what you're probably going to want to do is check out specific IPC subclasses. And so let's try that. Um, we can try as one example uh, C07K, which, if memory serves, is peptides, a type of organic compound. Here you can see uh, some variability in terms of the average years in prosecution in that column. And you can again drill down if you want to get uh, some further specific information as to what might have been going on in IPC C07K. Uh, try it again for a different classification. We can deselect uh, C07K and try something different. Um, I think E04B might be worth a look. I think that uh, that's general building construction in here. Yes, you can see uh, something different in terms of average prosecution times for uh, cases in uh, that particular classification. So there's a quick look at a few reports that um, might be of interest. As you can see, I've got 44 reports here. We've only looked at a small fraction of them, but I hope that that gives you an idea of the sorts of things that are possible with OLAP reporting and patent bibliographic data. Thanks very much.